book really, uh, it's, it's an edited volume uh, published by the Mapungubu Institute and being launched next week, as you said, along with the, the Vid School of Governance. Um, and although the book really locates uh, the protest phenomenon in, in South Africa's broader history of resistance, the point that the, the various contributors to the book are really making is that we need to understand uh, contemporary protest in South Africa really as a reflection of uh, the post-94 experience. Um, and th the book really tries to capture the diversity of protest actors, the diversity of protest spaces and communities of interest that engage in protest action. Um, but really, this that this broadly reflects um, popular experiences post-94. Um, and that's related to the quality of governance, to um, the absence of many of the anticipated substantive democratic outcomes post-94. Um, and, and generally a kind of common experience of a, of a sort of incomplete freedom on the part of citizens. So although we can reflect also on South Africa's broader history of protest, the book very much picks up on the, the underpinnings, the drivers, um, the structural causes of, of protests that we see in the post-94 period in particular. Mm. So um, just in terms of the surge of protests that we saw from the mid-2000s, has it continued in the same mm. way, sparked by the same causes uh, in this decade? Or has protest action become more complex? I know you also take a global view. If you could talk to us how South Africa differs, if at all, from the forms of protest or the reasons for the protests. Yeah, sure. So we've certainly seen an increase in the frequency of protest in South Africa, but also in the kind of range of, of types of protest action, um, in the intensity of protest, or as one of the um, authors in the volume, Professor Susan Boyson, refers to the density of protest actions. And this is kind of accompanied by a very much a critique of the state um, demanding more of the state, just demanding that the state play its role, but also sometimes a kind of a rejection of, of, of system politics or a rejection of formal politics as it is. So many protests in South Africa are underpinned by calls for service delivery, as we often see in the form of kind of community-based service delivery protests, but also demands for better governments, uh, better governance, sorry, more democracy, deeper democracy, um, but also in some cases um, a rejection of democracy or a potential rejection of, of established democratic values. Mm. And we tend often in South Africa to uh, look at ourselves very much in a local context, um, in our own kind of exceptional post-apartheid circumstances. But as you say, the book does try and draw on the global wave of protest that we've seen, particularly uh, since the onset of the 21st century. Um, and there's a chapter in the book that looks particularly at resonances between South Africa and, and not, not exclusively, but particularly other parts of the global South. Uh, where we've seen large numbers of protests, and in and in some in some senses, protests in South Africa um, differs from those experiences. We haven't seen the kind of national scale of of, of mass protest mobilisation, the sort of mass protest movements that we've seen, for example, in parts of Latin America, um, which drew large numbers of people onto the streets of cities like uh, Buenos Aires, for example. Um, and we haven't seen the kind of scale of, of uprising and revolution that we saw in parts of North Africa and the Middle East during the so-called Arab Spring. But if we look at the international experience of protests, we can identify similar drivers and underpinnings to those in South Africa. Many of the protests since the onset of the 21st century have been underpinned by issues of um, deepening economic inequality, what we might refer to as a democratic deficit where people's uh, experiences of democracy don't kind of match democracy's promise. Um, and also the very varied experiences of citizenship um, globally, and that's something certainly that we see reflected in protest in South Africa, um, is, is experiences of um, exclusion, um, be it social or economic or political exclusion, um, a very varied experience of citizenship and, and often calls for, um, for for greater societal inclusion and for human dignity, particularly when it comes to things like accessing basic services.
Mm. I, I'm curious, uh, the diversity of the protest spaces and actors and the responses to uh, protests from both citizens and state, what do you observe in your study? So we have a number of um, great contributors to the volume who have um, written a number of kind of case examinations, but also um, surveyed the kind of protest terrain, um, dealing with things like um, protests related to service delivery, and that picks up on issues of things like infrastructural citizenship um, in a chapter by Shauna Motia, where people's um, experiences and interactions with the state are very much based on their access to infrastructure and access to basic services. Um, also, the book reflects on uh, gendered issues in protests, um, how women's voices have been often erased um, from protest action historically it, it, in the struggle against apartheid, but also into the present day. And that's reflected in a chapter by Lingiwe and Lovu at the Bit School of Governance. Um, and the chapter also, the book, sorry, also talks about um, environmental protest as well. Um, the chapter by Fani Kapai that looks at um, the protests on the wild coast against shell oil exploration. So it really examines a diversity of, of, of spaces, of actors, of different communities of interests, um, and also looks at um, the state's response to protests. So there's a couple of great chapters um, that looks at the policing of protest, how in some cases the police um, can be part of um, uh, issues that, that trigger greater violence in protest, for All example. Right. And so the way the state handles protest itself has an impact on how on the, the forms of protest action that then take place and how protesters choose to um, to organise. So before you're out of time, I want to talk about that. Often people, when they think about protest action, they're viewed from the darker side of protests and the destruction and mm -hmm. divisions it may foment. But um, you also talk about in the book so how it's become a popular means of influencing policy directives. Mm -hmm. So just please juxtapose that. Yeah, so I think one of the things the book does it, it, in, in a number of the chapters, but also cumulatively, um, really makes the case that, you know, protest does continue to take place alongside uh, formal modes of political participation um, voting in elections and other means that, that we're provided for to formally participate in, in, in the political system. Um, so it's not replacing that, but rather complementing it and taking place alongside it. But also, we increasingly see these kind of blurred boundaries between protest action and other forms of collective violence. Um, there's a chapter in the volume by Mary de Haas that looks at the July 2021 unrest, for example, and, and the idea that that really went beyond protest. It went beyond what South Africans have become familiar with as protest action. And there are often these very uh, yeah, blurred lines, these kind of grey areas between uh, popular protest, which may in some cases turn violent, and other forms of, of, of collective violence that may be um, even, even manipulated to take place.